Hello, once again, this is Space Nuts. It's a Q&A edition. You know what that means. Uh, we ask nothing and you do the rest. Uh, all we ask of you is to send us questions and you do do that and we try to answer them, uh, including a question from Bob about the older universe, uh, which Fred remembers. Uh, Sean has a question about galaxies and their demise. James is talking about the origin of life on Earth and Michael. Uh, does dark matter uh, interact with itself? Those are the questions that we'll be tackling today on a Q&A edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. He's back again for more. His name is Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hey, hello. And his name is Professor Andrew Dunkley. Oh, I don't think I'll ever get that kind of title. <laughs> Sir Andrew Dunkley, how's that? Uh, what, well, Geordie like that? Yeah. No, he's barking mad about the idea. That's what's... <laughs> yeah. so what that is. Barking mad full stuff, I can tell yeah. you. Oh, yes. Well, you know, he's a terrier, isn't he? All terriers are barking mad. It's... Well, yes. No, no. He's 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 barking mad, but he's a poodle. A poodle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they're they're of a similar ilk. They are a similar. Ilk. Yes, he's. A, I, he's I think a... all those kinds of dogs suffer from small dog syndrome. That's what I think. It's just angry because they're tiny. <laughs> yes, that's just a theory. Not a dog person, so I don't know. Um, shall we try to answer some questions, Fred? Oh, I thought we were just going to have a chat, but. Oh, well, we can do that. Yeah, we can. Yeah, about dogs. Can do that. And yeah, yes. about dogs and dogs and cats living together. Oh, um, or we can answer this question from Bob. Gentlemen, comma, Bob from Central Florida in the United States. It occurs to me that as we look back at the older and older parts of the universe, it seems that the galaxies that far away should be farther back in time but closer together. Does that make sense from our perspective? This is the surface of a sphere far away, and we're at the center of it. And yet, back then, the universe hadn't been expanding as long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, sounds like it was at the mall. I could hear music in the background. Um, uh, I'm not. I, I've listened to the question a few times. I'm just. I'm not quite sure where he's coming from, and maybe it's just me. But um, what what what's the question about, Fred? Well, no, is, no offense, Bob. I'm not having a crack at you, but no, no, no Bob. Bob's right. Um, so uh, what Bob's saying is, okay, we live uh, in a universe that's 30.8 billion years old. It's ex been expanding for the whole of that time, and now we have the capability with the James Webb Telescope and other things coming on stream before too long uh, to see back probably 13 billion of those years. Uh, you know, we can see very early galaxies, and so. Uh, Bob's comment is, okay, the, the universe has expanded by a, a large fraction by uh, over that time, you know, factors like 20, something like that, 12 to 20 thereabouts. Shouldn't the galaxies look closer together? Mm. And they do. Uh, ah. They do. But it, it's a little bit more subtle because the way we know they're, they look closer together. Wait till you get this one. <laughs> oh boy! If you thought Bob's comment was strange, it gets even stranger. The the galaxies actually look bigger. Uh, with the expanding universe, you look further back in time, and eventually, uh, I mean, galaxies start to look smaller and smaller as you look out in the distance. You expect that. That's the way everything works in normal space, but. Um, the universe isn't normal space. It's been expanding and it's got curious properties. And you get to a certain point, which I don't think we've actually reached yet. I'm not sure that this is uh, something that's been proven, but the theory says that the galaxies should look bigger. Uh, and that's because they're closer together. So it, what, what, what it is, is the space between them is smaller. And that means the galaxies look, I know it sounds completely cockeyed, but that is what um, the relativistic model of the universe tells you. So what's the answer? <laughs> the answer is Bob's right. All right. Okay. Well done, Bob. 
And uh, I was in Florida not that long ago, and it was great. Yeah, I love Florida. We'll be there next year, uh, as a matter of fact. Lucky you. Uh, I think we go in March. Yes. Although I'm a little bit confused because we've got, we're going to Miami via Vancouver. Oh, yeah. Figure funnily, that one out. Funnily enough, that's what we did. Uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's the long haul. That's... Yeah, but, but we had a, a fortnight in between them. Oh, it's right. All good friends. We've done Vancouver, so yeah. we're just going to jump off one plane and jump onto the other. No, uh, Vancouver's so be, a lovely city. It's a it lovely is beautiful. Uh, the yeah. Vancouver Marathon was on while we were there. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I you, got had to, it. I, you had to go. I got to watch because it was just behind our hotel. Uh, it was lovely and went through the park and had, had a look around. Yes, yeah, beautiful city. Beautiful. Uh, thank you, Bob, uh, for your question. Our uh, next question comes from Sean. Oh, speaking of Canada, he's from British Columbia. Uh, all, uh, question, All uh, are all galaxies eventually going to get sucked into their central supermassive black holes? If so, then what? <laughs> or yeah. then what? Get the inflection yeah, no, right. I think then what is correct. Then what? As in? Now what? Mm. Yeah. Um, no, probably not. Um, because black holes, um, they do suck stuff in, but only if it happens to be kind of lying around. Yeah. Uh, and so a black hole compared with the size of a galaxy is very, very small. Uh, so I think what will happen in the longer term is galaxies will lose all their hydrogen fuel because that will go into making stars. Stars will live their lives, they'll create heavy elements, they'll blow up and either create black holes or white dwarfs or neutron stars or one of the end products of stellar evolution. And eventually they'll just become dark, they'll run out of energy, they'll become cold and dark, uh, but not necessarily getting sucked into the supermassive black hole. Uh, they may well just orbit around it and continue doing that until the big rip occurs or whatever is going to happen to space time yeah. with the expanding universe. Mm, or the Ganab Gib. We can have Gib, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, well, that's it, is it? There's not usually. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we see we see galaxies which have been, uh, which are devoid of their hydrogen fuel. We call them elliptical galaxies because they're quite different from the spiral galaxies. They're blobs of stars shaped like a football, elongated quite often. Uh, and uh, and they, uh, they they don't have any star formation going on in them, not much gas to speak of. Probably a supermassive black hole at the middle, but not doing much um, in terms of eating stuff up because it's all, it's eating it all up, what's available, and uh, is surrounded by a retinue of stars that it can't touch because they're too far away. Mm. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, this is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a break from the show to tell you about our sponsor, Incogni, and I'll be giving you a special Space Nuts URL so you can get up to 60% off Incogni. But first, what's Incogni all about? Uh, it's a way of cleaning up your online presence and reducing the risk of your personal information being sold to unscrupulous people via the dark web or just via a hacker who's trying to fleece you or other people. It's also a great way to reduce spam emails and spam phone calls, reduce the risk of identity theft, which is big business these days. I think, most significantly, it greatly reduces your risk of being scammed. And that is just such a viral thing that's happening around the world at the moment. So how does all this work? Well, it's simple. All you have to do is sign up to Incogni, give them permission to act on your behalf, and they'll do the rest. They'll trawl the internet and remove your personal information from the web, the stuff that can be found on search engines, public websites, even private databases. It's all easily accessible, and let's face it, uh, you're really going to be able to clean up the entire world wide web of your personal information by yourself. Right now, Incogni is offering a significant discount for Space Nuts listeners, up to 60% off, and that comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Just go to incogni.com slash space nuts. That's I-N-C-O-G-N-I, incogni.com slash space nuts to find out more. And... 
They have special prices for students and graduates as well. Make your personal information much harder to find online with Incogni. Check out all their plans today at incogni.com slash space nuts. Now, back to the show. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. And you're listening to a Q&A edition. And uh, yes, um, we, we love it when you send us your questions. So uh, you can do that via our website to give you all the details at the end of the program. Uh, our next question, Fred, comes from James. Good day, gentlemen. This is James from the mountains of Maine. I've enjoyed your podcast since your first episode. Please keep doing what you do. Here is my question. I have been reading recently that there is now tantalizing evidence that life may have begun on Earth as far back as 4.1 billion years ago. I believe this overlaps with the heavy bombardment period of our Earth's history. If this is truly the case, and we find microbial life elsewhere in our solar system, is it possible, or perhaps even likely, that it originally came from Earth? Thanks again for keeping the nerd in me alive. <laughs> uh, our great pleasure, James, and thanks for the question. You know, the origin of life on Earth, uh, there are those that say it probably um, came in from all sorts of different sources and got mixed up and voila, there we are. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a tough one to answer because um, you, you, you know, we've got evidence of life on Earth, but how on earth did it actually originate? Uh, well, it, it needed the right formula. It needed the right environment. It needed the right um, substances to mix with. Um, yeah, could it have already been here, get you know, ready to flourish during the early bombardment? Good question. Well, yeah. So, so I, I mean, um, you know, James's uh, postulate that maybe life was in existence on the earth as early as 4.1 billion years. I think the, the evidence is still fairly tenuous on that, but certainly 3.8 billion years, uh, there are rocks that show evidence that there was life there. So um, it is very old. Now, uh, the idea of life coming to earth from elsewhere is called the panspermia theory. Um, and that is one that is not generally favored by astrobiologists. I think most astrobiologists think a little bit, as James has suggested, that life formed on the Earth itself because we had the right conditions and the right um, prebiotic chemicals, all those organics that we've already found out in space, uh, the fats and lipids that you need to hold cell walls together and all of that sort of thing. Uh, so maybe life did kick off on Earth. Uh, if we find it elsewhere, like, if, for example, perseverance uh, on, on some of those little capsules that it's got left on the planet's surface on Mars, uh, if bringing some of those back found that, yes, there is a life uh, living organisms in there or even fossilized ones, uh, if we could somehow sequence the DNA of those and found that it had um, factors in common with life on Earth, yeah. then you could be pretty sure that that's what's happened, that the late heavy bombardment has stirred things up enough uh, that you've got life spreading throughout the solar system. Mm. Uh, and and it, we're not at a stage in the history of our exploration of the solar system that we can yet say that. Uh, we've still got a long way to go. Uh, but it is possible uh, that that might turn out to be the case. So it's not impossible, James. It's a good suggestion. Yeah, I just want to follow up on his um, suggestion that life could have been in existence 4.1 billion years ago. And you're saying, well, no, probably not that far back, but 3.8, 3.7. It doesn't sound like that's a big gap, but I suppose it realistically is in terms of the development of life. 300 million years. Yeah, it, well, it's not. No, you're right, because uh, life didn't do much uh, until only that about... It still doesn't. <laughs> Well, you know, in terms of evolution. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, it didn't do much until about 700 million years ago when we started getting all these multicelled organisms. So you've got this huge gap, uh, you know, th more than 3 billion years where all you had was single-celled slime, probably. Just yeah. slime. Uh, 
And so, um, if we, if yes, 3.8 billion year old slime and 4.1 billion year old slime might not be very different, if I can put it that way. Mm. Um, so, but but you um, you know, James's point is correct that that's the period when the late heavy bombardment was was in full swing. Uh, things were charging about all over the solar system. We think it's when the most of the big um, maria on the moon were created and the Aitken South Pole Basin, that biggest of all impact craters that we know about in the solar system. So it was a wild and woolly place. And it yeah. may well be that debris spread into space carrying microbes may have evolved into other things on Mars or even Venus. You know, Venus may well have had a very different climate back then. Hmm. Yeah, well, we've spoken in the past about the fact that um, scientifically they've suggested that at one stage there were three livable planets in the solar system. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So, um, yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, yeah, and as you say, the interesting thing will be if if Perseverance finds evidence of past life on Mars or we find evidence of life somewhere else in the solar system, maybe beneath the surface of the some of the ice moons, and we can do a DNA test and find out who it's related to. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, and, the, and yep. the big revelation will be, yes, it's the same as life on Earth. It's yeah, come from the same source or yeah. it's completely different. Yeah, that's right. And that, that's the big question. And, and if it's completely different, you could probably assume that it's fairly common throughout the universe mm. uh, because you've got you know widely different circumstances in which life might have taken hold in the solar system and if it's completely different then that's that leads you to the conclusion that it might form everywhere almost yeah well wouldn't that be something um yeah. we just got to find it that's the, <laughs> just got to get out there and find it yeah we do indeed thank you james great question i uh, love those early life questions and we've got one more question to tackle today from uh, Michael who lives in Illinois. Uh, I've just now listened to the dark matter story in the most recent uh, podcast which is no longer the most recent podcast. Uh, naturally I'm now prompted to ask yet another dark matter question. Does dark matter gravi gravitationally interact with itself? As always your best uh, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Um, we don't often get dark matter questions, so uh, thanks for that. Um, that's right. So um, I'm looking now at an article. Uh, when was it published? Uh, 4.1 billion years ago? No. Yeah. So, so the model that we have uh, of dark matter, this is the standard model, and and Dark matter, we don't know what it is. So, you know, you're always working in the dark here, if I can put it that way. Yes. Um, light, dark photons, weakly interactive, ma interacting massive particles, primordial black holes, all of those things. Uh, but the model that we have of the, basically the, 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 the you know, the, the, the way the building blocks of, of matter work, um, the model suggests that whatever it is, dark matter doesn't interact with itself, uh, and and because it can only interact with gravity, but not in itself. But the article I'm looking at uh, is from a paper, a set of papers. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but you can find it on Universe Today. It is called "Evidence of Dark Matter Interacting with Itself." in El Gordo merger. El Gordo is, uh, is the name of a galaxy cluster, if I remember rightly, and it's one merging with another one. And so uh, there is some evidence of dark matter interacting with itself from that, um, that, that galaxy cluster. And it comes from gravitational lensing. You can plot where the dark matter is by looking at the gravitational lensing. So the answer... Uh, yesterday would have been no, it doesn't interact with itself. But since I saw this article today, it's well, maybe it does. Okay. And then and what would that interaction entail? Uh, basically, it means, well, the, the way that they uh, have 
uh, drawn that conclusion is that when you plot where the dark matter is in these two galaxy clusters, normally what we see, and there are a number of examples of this, you, you, can, you can look at galaxy clusters that are merging, they're colliding. You can see that the stars and the gas all pile up into a central region, but the dark matter just keeps on going as though nothing had happened. Yeah. Uh, we see that. But there is some evidence in this particular one that shows some sort of streaming between the two blobs of dark matter associated with these two clusters oh. that are colliding. And that's, that's what uh, is, has led to this suggestion that perhaps dark matter does interact with itself. I, I'm not sure whether this might be a story we covered, actually, Andrew. Um, mm. It was uh, not very long ago, as I've said, last June. Uh, we perhaps should put it on the agenda to talk about in a little bit more detail. Poss possibly so, yes. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, there's, there's that much research going into this kind of thing. There's always something to talk about when it comes to dark matter and uh, always a question or two to answer. Uh, we get the occasional one ourselves. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, but the answer is possibly yes at this stage. Mm. Um, so the answers today went yes, um, no, not likely, and yes. That's right. I think. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Two and a half yeah. yeses is not bad. You know, it would have been a much shorter episode if I just went yes, no, yes, maybe not, you know, it's done. Would have been over in a minute. Yeah, could have done. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't have helped much. Uh, thanks, Michael. Great to hear from you. If you've got a question for us, go to our website because that's where you can send it through, spacenutspodcast.com, spacenuts.io. Up the top, there's a little tab that says AMA, and you click on that and you can uh, submit a text question or you can record if uh, you've got a device with a microphone. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Uh, you can record a question straight onto our website and send it through to us. Don't forget to tell, tell us who you are and where you're from. And I haven't mentioned this in a while, but uh, if you are uh, listening to us through whatever platform, please leave a review. Uh, reviews are very helpful. Um, you know, if, the, if, if it's only got one star, well, we know we've got to lift our game. Um, if it's got a few, that's great. If it's got five, um, thanks for lying. But uh, it's, uh, it's all good. Uh, we, um, yeah, we, we value your reviews greatly. Uh, they help us to be found. Uh, so do that as well, if you will. Uh, Fred, we're done. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Andrew, and we'll talk soon. We will indeed. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and here in the studio, uh, I don't think he surfaced today, so one star, one star for you, Hugh. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on another edition of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. <laughs>